I'd like to welcome John Baez in the form of Anani Bot and uh, turn the time over to him. Hello, everybody. I'm John Baez, and I'd like to tell you about my new weight loss plan. I dropped from 180 pounds to just 35 pounds in one minute when I switched to this stainless steel body here. Um, but actually, I'd like to thank Trevor Blackwell and Mike Stay for uh, help, helping me get set up. And uh, I'd like to tell you about some thoughts about energy, the environment, and what we can do about it. Um, I have just been thinking about this for the last couple of years. It's a huge issue, so I'll just dive in. So we get more and more energy from burning fossil fuels, mainly. All other forms of energy are almost negligible at present, although people are trying to change that. And so what that means is that in 2010, the average person on this planet put 1.3 tons of carbon into the air in the form of carbon dioxide, mainly from burning fuels, but also to some extent from uh, manufacture of cement. That's actually the second biggest cause of it. So the average American was considerably more than that. We put out about almost five tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. And so that, if you total it up, the average, that means the humans put 9.1 gigatons, billion tons of carbon into the air in that year. And it's been going up ever since. So to understand just how much we've done, you should look at this graph here. Uh, this shows carbon dioxide over the last 400,000 years. And you'll notice that it's oscillated between about 200 parts per million. Um, the graph that, I'm, that you're probably looking at now is this graph of uh, carbon dioxide slowly going up as measured in Hawaii, going up from about 310 parts per million in 1960 to about 390 parts per million now. You'll see these red wiggles are a kind of uh, annual cycle, but the blue average is what uh, counts the most, and of course the main thing is that it's increased by about 30% uh, in a fairly short time. So then if you go on to this next graph here, you'll see that in its proper perspective, namely that there have been uh, ice age cycles for the last 400,000 years or actually more, uh, this is how far back we can go from a certain ice core in Vostok, which is a base in Antarctica. And the warmer it is, the more carbon dioxide there is, and also the more carbon dioxide it is, the warmer there is. There's a kind of feedback mechanism involved, which takes us between 200 parts per million and about 300 parts per million as we go in and out of, of, of ice ages. But the far right of this graph shows an approximately vertical line, and that's us, the effect of humans, most of that since 1800, putting a lot of carbon dioxide out into the air. So what we're doing is an unprecedented experiment in uh, rapidly warming up the planet. The planet has been warmer than it is now at other parts of its history, but as far as we can tell, there's never been an episode where the temperature, well, the carbon dioxide concentration in this graph, but therefore the temperature has shot up so quickly. So it's the speed as well as the magnitude of this that uh, is what makes it all so scary and important. So if you 
Look at the temperature, as you'd expect from the greenhouse effect, it's been going up. It's gone up about 0.8 degrees in the last century or since 1880, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you'll see there are considerable wiggles there. We've got an annual plot on black, then a five-year running average in red. Uh, and because of this wiggliness, it's always possible to take a small portion of this graph and uh, say that climate change has stopped or warming has stopped and it's getting cooler. And so every so often you'll hear a news report saying, that, saying just that. But uh, that's just an effect of looking at small portions of this bigger trend, which shows no sign of stopping, actually. So what are the effects of this? Well, on the next slide here, you'll see that, for example, the Arctic sea ice is melting quite rapidly. This is quite a surprising graph to me when I first saw it. This is the volume of Arctic sea ice, uh, as estimated by this PM mass experiment. And uh, it's dropped by about a factor of four since 1979. So this is not one of these fake graphs where the zero of the graph is actually way below the horizontal axis, one of these fake graphs that people use to try to make things look more dramatic than they really are. This is a real graph, uh, so we're really heading towards no Arctic sea ice. This is the minimum Arctic sea ice, that is the uh, minimum that happens each year around September. We're heading towards no Arctic sea ice in September. Uh, Fairly soon, people are taking bets on when. Um, certainly, some, some people are taking bets that by 2030, the sea ice will be all gone. Although, if you just did a linear extrapolation from this graph, you'd probably say it will happen even sooner. Um, so that's the kind of thing we are seeing. And as the Arctic sea ice is melting, permafrost in Siberia is melting along with that. And so we... Uh, are getting releases of methane from, from the permafrost melting, and that's an amplifying factor that uh, people are fairly concerned about. Recently, a Russian uh, ship doing explorations directly north of Siberia and the Arctic Sea has seen huge of methane bubbling up from permafrost um, at the sea bottom, which is melting and releasing methane, and no one knows if these huge uh, bubble, bubbly regions in the ocean that he's discovered are, are new or whether they've been there for a long time. So it's uh, different people with different views have different ideas about how serious that problem is, but it's the kind of change you'd expect when you dramatically change the climate system. So, so far I haven't been making any projection, talking about any projections or climate models. A lot of people like to argue about uh, climate models. So I think it's nice to look at stuff about what's already happened and uh, not, not worry right away about the climate models. But still, of course, it's important to, uh, to say what we expect. And it's hard to know what to expect, mainly because it's hard to predict what people will do. So the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change has a range of projections given by these different curves and different colors in the graph here. Uh, so the CO2 concentration started at around 290 parts per million. Now it's around 390. But depending on what happens, by 2100, we could see as much as a thousand parts per million or, or maybe less, depending on what, what we decide to do, basically. So the, uh, the top curve there is a kind of business as usual, full speed ahead type model, uh, and the other, the other scenarios uh, involve various amounts of trying to, to reduce, deliberately reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, so far, the what people have been doing has been tracking along the very top of those different projections. So then what's the effect of all this? Well, there are lots of different arguments that say that each time you double carbon dioxide 
concentration in the atmosphere, it will increase the average temperature on the Earth by approximately a constant factor. That's just a rough rule of thumb, but there is this kind of logarithmic uh, dependency here. And so it's argued that it will go somewhere up between uh, two and four and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, if you're American and you're used to Fahrenheit, you have to multiply those by 1.8 to get the visceral sense for what that means. Uh, somewhere between there. So that's a big range. That's a huge amount of uncertainty, and that's why it's difficult to figure out uh, exactly how nervous to be. Uh, but even two degrees usually has considerable effects, as I will show you. So, um, so as I said, at the high end of the different scenarios, the atmosphere could contain about 950 parts per million of carbon dioxide by the end of this century. And so if you just feed that into this rough formula, you get temperature rises somewhere between two and a half and six and a half degrees uh, by the Celsius by the end of the century. Um, so that upper limit there, 6.4, that's quite, quite a lot. So going on to what that will cause, well, with just three degrees of warming, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences has uh, various predictions. So they predict that nine out of ten summers in the northern hemisphere will be exceptionally warm, meaning warmer than than one out of ten in the recent past. A lot more land will be burned by wildfires in parts of Australia, Eurasia, and North America. I believe we're already seeing that. We're seeing wildfires. You can argue about the cause. Uh, we expect extreme precipitation events meaning floods and various sorts, to increase by somewhere between 9 and 30 percent. We expect rainfall in some drier regions to drop by 15 to 30 percent. Uh, so in other words, there's a lot of more variability in the climate, more, uh, floods and droughts, uh, as the temperature rises. And this, in addition to affecting people, has a big effect on, on other species. Species have already been measured to be moving six kilometers closer to the poles every decade, which is quite a remarkable rate of change, especially if you realize that that means the, uh, the trees are going to have quite a bit of trouble keeping up. You don't usually see trees moving that fast. Trees actually do move around, uh, very slowly, not individuals, but as a collective. So every time the ice age, an ice age ends, oaks and first pines and then oaks and then other species move north. Uh, but that's a process that usually takes uh, centuries to, to millennia, not, and we're, we're basically uh, pushing it to the limit. And so what that means is that the rate of extinction of, of animal life will increase, as we've in fact been seeing. No one quite knows where, where it's going to end up. It's quite hard to predict. Uh, the predictions go between something like 20% and 30% of species uh, could die off by 2,100 if we, uh, if we keep, keep at it and keep doing what we're doing now. So that's significant to me. Um, so the question then is, what can we do about this? Um, so I could continue trying to convince you that this is really, that these are really problems, uh, but I think the debate about climate change is unfortunately s sort of stuck in trying to convince the, everybody in the world that, that these problems are real, and that is keeping us from moving on to the next stage, which is a big public debate about what are, or what are the solutions. So I'd like to just move right on to the solutions. So on this next slide, uh, I, here's what we can do, just as a perfectly uh, sort of broad uh, outline of what we can do. 
the first key thing to realize is that slowing the rate of carbon burning is not enough because most carbon dioxide stays in the air for a long time, over a century. Individual molecules come and go. They get absorbed by, by plants, but then they get re-emitted. And so for, for carbon dioxide to really go away, to really get sequestered out of the atmosphere, uh, take, takes much longer, too long basically for us to uh, worry about in, the, in this issue of trying to stop climate change or slow climate change. So the saying that people give that summarizes that, which I hope you all tell your friends, is carbon is forever. You've heard the saying diamonds are forever. Well, carbon dioxide is unfortunately approximately forever as far as, our, as the problem we're dealing with, unless we go out of our way to do something about it. So there seem to be basically four options that we could do some mixture of. We could just leave fossil fuels unburnt. So I'm saying that slowing the amount of, at which we burn them is, is, is just slows the rate of the problem, but leaving them unburnt would, would actually stop the problem. We could live with a hotter climate. We will certainly be doing plenty of that, I think, because we're not slowing things down enough uh, to, to avoid that needing to do that. We could sequester carbon, that is actively put it underground or underwater. There are a variety of schemes for doing that. The Chinese are currently the leaders in building coal-fired power plants that uh, sequester the carbon dioxide uh, by pumping it underground. There aren't lots of these plants, but they do have plants that, that work that demonstrate the, the principle. Or and or we could actively cool the earth. This usually goes by the name of geoengineering, although all forms of geoengineering amount to cooling the earth, but uh, there are different ideas that have been proposed to uh, reduce the amount of sunlight hitting the earth uh, and other, other things. That's the main one, though, to, to cool things down. Um, of course, geoengineering is something that people find very scary, but it is certainly a logical possibility, and we need to really examine this all in a logical way. So in my next slide here, this is a useful way of organizing our thoughts about the magnitude of the problem. So in 2004, these two guys at Princeton, Pakala and Sokolo, they looked for ways to hold carbon emissions constant for the next 50 years from then. Um, so that would not be a solution, again, that would just be a start to the problem. So the idea is we hold it constant for 50 years, we suffer to a certain extent, but then we're maybe in a better position to really lower it. So they said it would require seven wedges, these green wedges here. So each one of those is a way to reduce carbon emissions more and more, ending up by reducing it one gigaton per year by 2054 so that instead of going up to the projected amount of carbon emissions of uh, 14 gigatons, it, it would stay constant at 7 gigatons. That was their I idea at the time. They, uh, they were optimistic that that could even be possible because it's already gone above 7, but it's still a useful uh, thing to think about. So here are some examples of wedges which they proposed. They were trying to use wedges that would uh, use existing technology. So one would be wind power. So we could reduce, uh, sorry, replace 700 gigawatts of coal-fired power plants by wind power to accomplish one wedge. So that would mean that starting now in 2011, we'd need to multiply the existing amount of wind power by a factor of 12.5 uh, by 2054. Um, that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. It's a major task. The, the good news is that if you just look at the percentage growth of wind power right now, we, if we could keep up that percentage growth rate, we'd be on track to doing that and getting one wedge. Of course, percentage growth rates are, get harder to keep up when you've got more wind power already in place. Um, so the next wedge... I'd like to talk about is solar power. So you could replace the same amount of coal power by solar power, and that would accomplish a wedge. That would, however, require multiplying existing solar power by a factor of 80. Uh, there's a, a lot less solar power in, in operation now. Um, 
And so in terms of percentage, oh, uh, yeah, so we're, in terms of, I don't have the percentage growth rate here, but, uh, but in fact, the percentage growth rate of solar power in the last five or so years has been so high that we are on track to do that if we can manage to keep it up. Um, nuclear is the next item. We could replace the same amount of coal power by, by nuclear power. Of course, lots of people hate nuclear power, but there is a lot of it uh, compared to these other forms of power. So that would only require doubling the world's existing supply of nuclear power. So those are different ways of generating more energy, and you can see that uh, even if we did all three of those, that would just be less than half the way towards solving the problem. So another line of attack is through conservation. So suppose you, the number of cars quadruples in, in, by 2054, going from 500 million to four times that amount. That's a fairly reasonable estimate. Um, so then you could uh, accomplish a wedge by somehow making everyone in the world drive half as much. That's tough. Um, another, another one would be uh, making cars twice as efficient, but without making people, letting people drive more, or somehow coaxing them not to drive more. So you may have heard of the Jevons paradox, which is as you make something more efficient, it becomes cheaper, and under some extreme conditions, that can even make them use more of it. That, that's actually not usually what happens. Usually what happens is that they, is that that, uh, that effect of partially counteracts the increases in efficiency but doesn't uh, completely counteract it. Uh, and so any efficiency measure faces that uh, risk, but, but it's not, it doesn't make, it, doesn't make those con measure measures worthless. Um, so the next one, uh, is I want to talk about is uh, conservation and efficiency for buildings. Um, so you could cut carbon emissions by 25% uh, in buildings and appliances to accomplish one wedge. In other words, increase uh, efficiency of, of, of heating by insulation mainly by 25%. That's by far the easiest wedge of, it, of any that I, I've seen. Uh, this is something that could really be done without uh, heroic measures, and so people should just definitely do that. So those are different wedges. So I hope you see that each wedge is a big job, and indeed this way of uh, slicing the problem into gigaton-sized wedges <clears throat> makes it seem pretty, pretty difficult. Um, in, in particular, because uh, the number of wedges has, has gone up since Pakala and Sokolo wrote their paper, by now we'd actually need nine to get down to, 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 the, to the seven billion uh, tons of carbon emission uh, per year that they had when they wrote their paper. And you have to, again, I just can't emphasize this enough, remember that keeping carbon emissions constant just means that warming will continue at about the same rate that it's, that it's going on now. It's just a stopgap, a kind of stopgap before we do get to really serious and reduce emissions. Um, so how much would we have to reduce the emissions to get out of trouble? Well, there are lots of estimates of that. There's a pretty good paper by Meinshausen and some co-authors that estimate that Cutting uh, current emissions in half by 2050 still leaves a 12 to 25 percent chance of a two degrees Celsius or more uh, rise. Um, so a lot of people argue that uh, we need to cut carbon emissions in half by 2050. Some UN recommendations are trying to be more safe, so to speak, uh, at 80 percent cut in carbon emissions by 2050, but as you can see that these massive cuts uh, go way beyond 
what Pakalo and Sokolo suggested and so would require even more heroic measures on the part of humanity. So we need to take dramatic action on many different fronts. It's clear from this wedge analysis that no one thing will be the magic solution to, uh, to carbon emissions. Sorry, I just got myself into an interesting mode here. That was fun. It's so fun being a robot. I'll explain why I'm doing this silly thing of uh, giving the talk in the form of a robot pretty soon. Um, it's clearly not yet optimized. Uh, but it's fun. So moving on to the next slide here. So what, what, what do we need to do? Well, most of all, I think everybody who cares about uh, global warming knows that we need to put a price on carbon in some form that reflects its true cost, including the damage that it causes. Uh, right now, you can make money by burning stuff and pumping the waste into the, into the air. Uh, it's very easy to make money if, if you don't have to clean up after your mess, and that's, that's the problem. Of course, the objections to this uh, idea of a price on carbon is that it would uh, hurt economic growth, and that's certainly true to some ex extent. One can ask, however, though, whether uh, economic growth that winds up uh, severely damaging the planet and the people on it really counts as growth. Uh, there's also, I think, just a basic point that I wish uh, people would, everyone would recognize, which is that uh, nothing can grow forever in a finite system. No one quantity can grow exponentially in a finite system. Maybe we can switch over towards being happy in different kinds of ways by being smarter and things, but no one particular way of doing things can grow exponentially forever. So, so, so when, when you're talking about economic growth, if you're talking about growth of any particular measure of the economy, it's got to slow at some point. And so the question is not should it slow, but how will it slow and how should it slow? Sudden, gently or with a crash? Right now we're basically taking the accelerate our car into a brick wall approach of uh, just going full speed ahead until we're forced to stop. So businesses and government need to eventually learn to switch away from wanting the GNP, for example, to grow exponentially. Part of that is understanding that exponential growth is, a, is a, only at best a temporary situation, but part of it is using better economic indicators. For example, there are various, uh, various people have developed things called a genuine progress indicator, which may be a bit too optimistic a, a term for it, but the idea of gen, this genuine progress indicator is that you uh, take into account costs as well as benefits. So, for example, if you decide to uh, cut down all the trees in the United States to make paper one year, well, the GNP will shoot up, but that doesn't actually mean that things have gotten much better because you haven't uh, taken into account the cost. You, you should take into account the costs. So, in short, what we need is an intelligent economic system. Uh, there's uh, there's ec economics as practiced by economists, and then there's economics as practiced by governments, which are slightly different, the, the, uh, and bankers. The, 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 it's an interlocking set of ideas about economics, ranging from the theoretical to the practical, to, 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 the, to the real world, that all needs to change. That's not going to change uh, suddenly. It's got an, an immense internal momentum, but nonetheless, it has to change, and it, I can just assert that it will change simply because no quantity will grow forever. So the question is how to change it. How will it change? So here's something a little more concrete. On the next slide here, we see McKinsey and Company, this uh, management consulting company, 
they've done a nice report in which they argue that the world could cut carbon emissions by 10 gigatons per year, that's all of Pakla and Sokolo's wedges, uh, by 2030, in fact, at, no, at roughly no net cost. So I know it's hard to see the details of this funny looking graph here, but the idea is that the vertical axis is <clears throat> how much it costs in, I guess, euros per ton of carbon dioxide to, uh, to cut carbon emissions in various ways. And, and so it starts out being negative below the horizontal axis on the left. So there you see different measures, tons of them in fine print that's sort of hard to see until you download a copy of my talk and stare at it. Uh, which, so at the left, there are cost-saving measures that get us up to a, uh, about uh, roughly about 15, uh, that's gigatons of carbon dioxide, not of carbon. Per, per year, you have to divide by 3.6 to get the, uh, the carbon. Uh, and then over towards, sorry, that's over at the left, and then over at the, at the right, you see measures that have a positive cost. Uh, and, and so what they're trying to point out is that we can get a substantial way towards our, our goal by various kinds of efficiency measures, uh, lots of them, uh, which will actually save money in the long run. These, these uh, costs are up till 2030, so a lot of these efficiency measures require upfront investments, and that's what, why people aren't already doing them. So if you, like me, took a while to uh, buy f complex fluorescent light bulbs to replace incandescent light bulbs, then you know how an expensive uh, initial purchase can deter you from doing something, even if it will save you money in the long run. And all these efficiency measures have that, have that character, of course. So uh, you could hope that governments would provide different uh, methods to uh, ease people into, into doing these cost-saving measures, which, which they are, in fact, in some cases. Uh, the fact that it's a no net cost for doing all these measures is... Uh, of course, poses a big problem because if you have some people saving money by doing some of these measures, uh, that's not going to make necessarily make other people want to spend money to do other measures or even want to make the same people sp spend the money they've saved on other measures. So this uh, no net cost model only works, uh, only, only happens if you have some way of, uh, of transferring the money from one to the other. Uh, and of course, the, our traditional way of doing that is with governments, and uh, that's where government, I think, may have to come in, unless people get other bright ideas for, for making people do good things. So one th other thing here is that uh, in 2010, the we, meaning governments worldwide, that's what I would mean by we here, is spent about $409 billion subsidizing the use and the production of fossil fuels. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that uh, it's pretty easy to uh, see as a good idea to stop. That in actually increases the use of fossil fuels while simultaneously wasting money. Stopping it is, of course, incredibly difficult because of the interlocking nature of uh, big businesses that, that, that produce the fossil fuels with the governments that are regulating them. And that, of course, that's the big problem for all of these ideas. Um, moving on to some other ideas. I think we need lots of ideas. So it's possible that we need nuclear fuel. This is a heresy in certain circles, uh, but that's why I need to talk about it. <laughs> so. If you go to download the, the versions of these slides, you can click on any claim I make and, and get taken to a link that gives evidence for that. So I, when I say there are calculations arguing that without nuclear, we're stuck in solving global warming, you could click on that and see a paper that, that crunches the numbers and attempts to demonstrate that. You really need numbers to, uh, to make these arguments. You, you can't just uh, hand wave. Of course, right now I don't have any hands, so I can't hand wave, but, but, I, but I also don't uh, feel like 
going through all these numbers, but, but they're crucial. Uh, and so you have to click on the link to get into an argument with these people. If, so uh, there's another paper uh, that argues that if you add nuclear power into the mix, then we actually have a chance. It, remember, it's a, it's a problem that needs to be solved by a, a rough deadline. It's not, it's, I mean, there's no specific deadline, but it's not a problem that we can take forever to, to solve. And, that, and that's why it may be necessary to, uh, to throw nuclear into the mix instead of just waiting for the, the nice renewable uh, energy supplies to, uh, to grow to the point where, they're, where they do the job. So I would love someone who disagrees with this and thinks that nuclear is not necessary to actually uh, write a paper that, that crunches the numbers and plausibly gives a different conclusion. Um, of course, nuclear power has plenty of problems. Safety of the reactors themselves is one issue. We would need to get a lot better at building reactors to turn off, not continue to heat up when something breaks, when the power goes out. So at Fukushima, for example, the idea of storing nuclear waste in pools of water that, uh, that are on the second floor of a building and leak out when a disaster happens and then the waste uh, melts, that's, in retrospect, not the best uh, way to do things. Um, and hopefully people can actually learn from these mistakes and embrace uh, what's called passive nuclear safety, whereas if you pull out the plug and make everything break, the, the, the nuclear plant is at least very likely to turn off. However, it's worth noting that some calculations, which you can see if you click here, show that coal, burning coal, causes at least about 1,000 times as many deaths per kilowatt hour as nuclear power. You see, with nuclear power, although people are concerned about accidents and wastes, and Chernobyl definitely did kill a lot of people. In general, people don't uh, take spent nuclear fuel and shoot it up into the atmosphere on purpose. Uh, whereas with coal, that's just exactly what, what happens. We burn it and it goes up into the air, and it causes very large numbers of deaths due to lung disease, particularly in China where the regulations are lousy. Um, and so I think that some of our worries about nuclear power come from a uh, sort of mistaken perceptions of what counts as risky and what counts as not risky. Of course, there really are things that are worse about a whole bunch of people uh, dying at, or getting scared at once than a few people, Chinese poor people, dying every day. But... Uh, but still, I think coal should be the villain, not nuclear. So India and China are busy building nuclear reactors, uh, and these are the big countries that actually really matter for a lot of these problems. So in some sense, you could say it doesn't really matter too much what uh, Germany or Japan or even the United States does about this. What it really matters is what these other countries do. Um, anyway, that's just a thought to throw out there. So, moving on, what can other kinds of people do? Most people are quite poor, <laughs> and they can't build nuclear power plants or do much of anything like that. A lot of people are subsistence farmers. So what can poor subsistence farmers do about global warming? Well, what they can do is called biochar. It's a fancy name for making low-grade bad charcoal and burying it. So if you burn agricultural waste in a low oxygen environment, you know, cover it up with some, some stuff so it, it can't, uh, not too much of it turns into carbon dioxide, you make charcoal. And if you bury that, it makes the soil better. And if you dig into the Amazon jungle, you'll see layers and layers of soil that's been enriched by biochar. In the, the early civilizations there knew about this, that the jungle soil is really infertile on its own. Own, but it's improved that way by biochar. And the great thing about biochar is that it sequesters carbon for hundreds or thousands of years. And it harnesses the power of plants to do carbon sequestration. It's hard to do carbon sequestration at a large enough scale, but that's one way to do it. What can high-tech 
dreamers who like fancy ideas do, well, um, one thing they can do is get serious about studying geoengineering, not just with pencil and paper calculations, but actually doing some experiments. So, for example, the science fiction and writer and uh, physicist Gregory Benford down at UC Irvine, he's done a, written a paper estimating that cooling the Arctic would only cost uh, 300 million years, 300 million dollars a year if we used uh, these big uh, military refueling aircraft to spray sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere of the Arctic. It makes cirrus clouds which reflect light. And that would be uh, a good thing <laughs> to test out on a small scale. It's the kind of thing that you could you could test a little patch of air for a while and see what happens. There will, of course, be unexpected side effects. That's why we can't uh, jump into doing anything like this without running a big risk. It's possible that anything we do along these lines runs a big risk, but you have to also realize that, doing, that not solving the global warming problem runs a big risk, so it's a matter of weighing risks. And what I'm worried about is that the people will think that geoengineering is a terrible idea and not even think about it until global warming becomes such a bad problem that people become desperate and are willing to grasp at straws and just try anything. And then if we haven't studied geoengineering, we'll find ourselves trouble. So I think uh, studying it at the very least is a great idea. And finally, well, what can you and I do? Well, some of you actually are high-tech dreamers, so I, you should, uh, you already, uh, I already gave you guys some suggestions. But um, what can a poor little old mathematician like me do? Well, one thing I can do is fly less, uh, which is, in fact, what I'm doing right now, uh, not flying over there, instead talking through this robot. Um, so for the average person of our income bracket, the easiest way to take a big chunk off of our carbon emissions is to take one less long flight, one fewer long flight. So one round trip flight from Singapore to San Francisco, the flight that I didn't take, uh, burns 0 0.9 tons of carbon. So that's 70% of an average human's uh, yearly amount of carbon right there in one in one trip, or 20% of the average American, since Americans uh, love to burn carbon in large amounts. Uh, so what this means is that by using telepresence methods, for example, this robot here, we can save a lot of carbon emissions. Um, of course, this robot that I'm using here is not at all optimized for giving uh, conference talks, and we didn't even ran into a bit of jam and had some trouble uh, getting, getting set up. So this talk is a little bit uh, creaky, more of a gimmick than, a, than what I really suggest, the, the way uh, that should be the future of conferences, for example. But, but, it, but this robot is good for what it was uh, designed to do, which is basically to have a someone at a company continue to talk with people at, at that company when they, when they go somewhere else. It's, it's better for face-to-face -face conversation than uh, in these kind of presentations that I'm giving now. And different kinds of robots could be made that could, and, and of course, much easier, technically easier things like video conferencing can be done. It, it means we don't need to zip around the planet so much uh, to do our business. Okay, so that's, that's why the robot. Um, so what else can we, can we do? On the next slide here, the obvious thing that all of us can do, not just uh, university profs like myself, but, but really everyone can do is educate. Educate in both senses, educating ourselves and then educating our, our friends. Um, that's really, in a sense, a large part of the problem, you see, right? We don't have enough people who even believe that global warming is real. We've got large United States, for some reason, more than any other country in the world. We have lots of people who think it's all just some gigantic hoax perpetrated by scientists to, uh, to take over the world or something. Uh, uh, 
So we need clear thinking and good understanding of the facts now more than ever. You see, global warming is, is perhaps the first problem that really needs a, a global response because of its uh, prisoner dilemma quality that if just some countries uh, cut carbon emissions and others uh, burn, burn more, that, that's not going to cut it. So we need a global response. So we need everybody to understand and think about what's going on. And of course, uh, if you start reading on the internet about climate change, you'll find a, a huge diversity of opinions, many of them not backed up by facts. So you really need to be uh, very careful on both sides of the debate in uh, checking what's going on and weighing the evidence. Uh, so it's, it's a uniquely uh, educational dilemma you, where you need to learn about everything from atmospheric physics to economics and so on. Uh, so finally, this is the part of the talk where you would normally expect someone to ask you for money, uh, but I'm not asking you for money. Uh, but I, I'm running this project called the Azimuth Project, which is a bunch of mathematicians, scientists, and engineers who are trying to do various things to, uh, to tackle this problem. So we're trying to study and collect, first of all, various known plans of action, like this McKinsey report and the Pakala Sokolo report and many others, uh, and, and make them study them, make them available all in one place, and compare them. On the more mathematical end, because I teach at a university and need to prove theorems, uh, I'm studying what I call network theory, which is a study of uh, complex systems made out of lots of interacting parts. That's, that's just uh, something that's just generally good for all these problems like uh, e ecological and climate problems. Uh, and climate cycles, I just happen to be a little fascinated by the ice ages these days. There's been a lot of work done on that, but the interesting thing is that no one really knows exactly what makes the ice ages work the way they do. There are slight changes in the Earth's orbit, which everyone seems to agree are the causes, but if you look at how those causes things, the, the effect seems uh, radically disproportionate to the cause. So there are, must be a lot of amplifying feedback mechanisms. So there's also something called stochastic resonance where randomness actually manages to amplify, uh, amplify effects under certain circumstances. So that's an interesting issue, just if you're a scientist and you like to do interesting work, but it's also important because uh, we're, we're pushing the Earth into a, a new uh, climate regime now, and if we, we don't fully even understand what's been going on with the ice ages, it suggests that there will be things that we don't understand about what's go going to start happening now. And so uh, understanding the ice ages is at least somewhat helpful for that. Okay, and next on this next slide here, uh, I list a bunch of things that the Azimuth Project is uh, studying or describing on our wiki. So the problem is not so much uh, developing new information, but collecting information, making it available, making it sourced, making it reliable on a large variety of problems. One problem I didn't emphasize enough was uh, ocean acidification, the rise in the acidity of the ocean due to the carbon dioxide. Most carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a while, then it goes into the water, and, uh, and, and so there's a, the, the, both the atmosphere and the ocean are, are, are big reservoirs of carbon dioxide. And, and for the water, what it means is that uh, mollusks, coral reefs, and so on are beginning to have tr trouble surviving and will start to actually dissolving past a certain point. And, and I mention this just because attempts at uh, geoengineering, which cool the planet but don't, uh, don't do anything else, don't tackle that problem. So there is actually uh, an important extra side to carbon dioxide besides global warming. Uh, so finally, you could ask, will this work actually stop global warming, the stuff we're doing on the Azimuth Project? And the answer it is no, it won't by itself, of course, stop global warming. The problem is, is vast, um, and so we shouldn't have any 
big ambitions about or uh, illusions about any one uh, effort doing that much, but it's at least something to be doing to help the problem. And I think you folks at Google are in a position to do a lot of different things and do a lot, a lot more in certain ways than we are. So, so here's a URL for this talk, which lets you uh, click on on anything I said and let you see 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 what the evidence is for it. Because you shouldn't trust what I'm saying blindly, just like uh, for anyone else. Okay, so th thank you for your patience. Uh, thanks for listening to this funny robot talking to you for an hour. And uh, if you've got any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, manufacture of concrete as the second greatest uh, thing that puts carbon into the atmosphere. None of the wedges that you mentioned seem to deal with that. Are there any opportunities for our reduction of that? Yeah, there there are. I mean, the second one is much smaller than the than the first one. I forget the exact numbers right now, but but I but I. I can't even remember if Pakala and Sokolo listed as a wedge, as an official wedge, but there is stuff you can do. There are actually um, new forms of concrete that people are testing that, that don't uh, release carbon dioxide as they, as they cure and harden. And uh, uh, so, so, yeah, there, there's definitely stuff that could be done there. So the, as usual, the, question, the problem is at first that the, those new forms of concrete cost more than the old forms, and so you need to, you know, get better at making it cheaper, or coax people to use it, and so on. But yes, that's definitely something that can be done. Yes? Yeah. Um, you, you asked for sort of, uh, papers refuting the need for nuclear power. I know that there's papers by Amory Lovins and the Rocky Mountain Institute claiming that for uh, analyses of nuclear power, saying that whatever you would spend on nuclear power, you get better bang for your I haven't, uh, no, I haven't looked at that. I mean, the funny thing about that is that probably efficiency trumps all other measures in terms of, of cost. So, uh, so, so that could be true, but still not the reason that nuclear power is worse than other things. But I'll have to look at that to, to see what, what exactly, what, what exactly. I really love to so look at that. So thanks. But I, I really would love to see some some uh, some well worked out plans for how how much uh, power we're expecting people to want to to use. You can, can try to cut that back by efficiency measures, and then how we could generate it by uh, renewable means other than nuclear for people who, who want to avoid nuclear. But but anyway, thanks. Yeah, that'll be good to look at. Anything else? Okie doke. Thanks a lot for, for bearing with me here in this funny form. I'm actually much nicer and more entertaining normally. Uh, <laughs> I, I gesticulate, I dance around, I do all sorts of great stuff. But, uh, but anyway, great. Thanks very much. And thank uh, Trevor Blackwell here for uh, helping make it possible. And uh, also thank uh, Mike Stay. Uh, for for doing a lot of the the, the work and setting this up, okay. I'll, I guess I will just stand here since I can't really go anywhere, and I'll, I'll be glad. To, uh, not very fast anyway. I won't try to like make my escape down the hallways of Google, although that would be sort of amusing. Uh, so if anyone wants to come up and talk to me, I'll be glad to talk. I guess you could maybe have more of a, a nice conversation if you get closer. Okay. Well, let's give Dr. Baez a hand. <laughs>